All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Dedicated Show. This is Kate Strashna, your host. Today, we have a special guest with us. His name is George Firikin, and he is the founder of Lights on Data. We have a lot of great topics lined up for today, and I want to remind the audience to feel free and jump in with any questions or comments that you have. We will try to go through as many audience questions as we can. I personally have a lot of questions that I want to ask George. Um, today, we're going to talk about a lot of different things. We'll, we'll touch on data quality, data storytelling, data stewardship, uh, data governance, data dictionary, data catalogs, business glossaries, as well as drinking lattes and potentially being bad at surfing. Maybe we'll talk about cats. We'll see where this goes. Um, as you're joining the show, I do ask that you let us know where you're tuning in from. And yeah, if you've got any questions, like I said, feel free to jump in. I'm going to go ahead and bring George on our show here. Hello, George. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the show. I love your shirt. Data Keated. Oh, oh. Yeah. Where, where are we? There you go. What, what's, yes. with the, what's with the dab? You know, it's, do you still do that thing? Uh, you know, it's, it's just something that came up when I was looking for a little panda. Yes, and I thought it was it was fun. We also have the unicorn. I love it. The same thing. I think it's fun. Yes, I love it. I love it. So it's George, one of my you, favorite shirts. Okay, good. I'm glad you actually wear it. I've actually heard um, a few other prior speakers of the conference that like sleep in the shirt. So I'm like, okay, that's good. Mm. So they're they're using it. They dream um, of being dedicated. <laughs> yes, you become more dedicated, right? Mm -hmm. As you as you wear the dedicated shirt. Um, it, it actually reminded me, I think it was Kristen Kerr who asked like, how long can you survive on just your swag? If, if you had to get rid of all your clothes and just had yes. your swag, it was pretty funny. I think you said that you'd have all these shirts, hoodies and, and, and hats. And yeah. I, also, I also have socks and mugs, but right. yeah, nobody really gives out pants. <laughs> yeah. So we couldn't really, yeah, we could survive, but in a different world. <laughs> yeah. The Winnie, Winnie Pooh <laughs> style, right? She said. Exactly. Donald Duck. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. All shirts, no pants. All shirts, no pants. Well, you know, some of them are actually big because a lot of times when people send me swag, it's like size large men's. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. My mm -hmm. husband gets a lot of my uh, my swag. So I'm like, here you go. More data shirts. It's like, great. Okay. He actually wears <laughs> them too, which is funny. Oh, <laughs> uh, I see Andrew's here. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. We've got folks hey, from Argentina, Greece. Wow. So thank you for joining so we'll be live for about 45 minutes to an hour as per the huge. Um, but as we get started, George, let's hear a little bit about you. Tell us your life story. Life story. Well, yes. that's going to get long. Should I fast forward to listen? <laughs> I have an accent. The reason why I have an accent is because I'm from Romania, which is in Eastern Europe still. And I came to Canada when I was about 14, 15 with my parents. So I didn't do any of the heavy lifting, they were all responsible for that. Went into computer science, played basketball on the side, uh, never considered it as a career alternative because I was too short, but I still play it, I still love it. After computer science, I actually went and practiced and I became a programmer, I was back in front end as well. Fell in love with you know e-commerce, that was, that was one of the um, startups I was working for. And by the way, I recommend going into a startup for anybody that has that chance, because you get to wear multiple hats, especially if it's a smaller company, you get to experience different roles and really learn different skills. It's really a great environment to go and work in as at least one of the first few jobs. Anyways, fast forward a little bit, that really got me you know, interacting with data, working with databases and so forth and so on. But I was more and more interested with the client side of things. So maybe because of that, I also got into business analysis and then project management. And through project management, having all these discussions, really understood how data impacts the customer and kind of the other way around the decisions that are being made and how that data should be recorded. And then if it's not managed, the repercussions it has and how it gets into reports and the data analytics models and then ultimately decisions that are being made based on that, you know, poor data quality. Again, if it's not managed, if it's not governed. So... Yeah, with that in mind, really stepped into a data quality role. And then I found out you can't really do data quality without data governance. And years later, here I am still in this field. I practice data governance every single day and I work with an amazing group of people. And uh, all of this also uh, made me found lightsondata.com, which puts the lights on data by educating people on how to best manage it and govern it. 
Awesome. I love it. Great story. I don't think I've heard um, this before that you moved when you were 14. I guess I, I always knew you moved from Romania, but I never asked how old you were. That must have been tough. So you were probably what, like eighth, ninth grade, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But then they skipped me like a couple of grades. So I went into 10th grade here okay. and um, and that was fun. Did you so did you have to learn the language or did you just speak English and I, Yeah, I knew English before, but okay. you know, there's certain things that you don't get. So here's a story that I I sometimes share in my business glossary uh, live course. I was at my friend's house and uh, you know, we we're playing video games on the couch, and there was like all this loud noise and banging and clacking and you know, screaming from the garage. And I asked Justin, what's going on? Like, we can barely hear ourselves play the video game Mario Kart, or I don't know what it was. And he's like, yeah. oh, it's just my dad. He's making a racket. And, you know, my my English, my ESL, English as a second language skills, I thought, that's so cool. His dad is building rackets. And that's why I thought he his dad like a racket? was like, like a racket, like a tennis racket, you know, badminton racket. For six months, I thought that's what he does. But, you know, he was, I don't know, cleaning in the garage or something. He was making a racket, like making loud noises. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, there were certain things like that that I didn't get. It took me some some time to understand and learn. Yes, I can definitely relate. I mean, I, I moved to the States when I was almost nine from Tajikistan. And there I have several stories of just like thinking that I'm doing something right. Like I didn't know that you have to raise your hand really high to get the teacher's attention and my first few days in school, I didn't speak English or like that was my first time in, in a school ever. I was just stretching while walking, mm -hmm. sort of confused, not knowing what's going on. And then everyone starts asking me questions like, what do you need? What do you need? And I'm like, what do these people want from me? <laughs> so they found a Russian speaking lady and she's like, you raised your hand. And I'm like, my goodness, that's all I have to do to get all this attention. <laughs> I was so confused. <laughs> so durable. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm just checking in. We've got folks from Azerbaijan, wow. we've got Ghana, Brazil, Pakistan. I love this. It's such a cool mix. Such a diverse group. Kristen's here. Hey, Kristen. Kristen. We were just talking about you. How's it going? <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. You can press <laughs> rewind. It was all good. <laughs> so you mentioned um, lights on data. I think we mm -hmm. should talk about that for a bit. Now, let's start at the beginning. When you were sort of buying the domain lightsondave.com, right? What was yeah. going on through your head? What what did you want to accomplish with this? You know, the, all all the credit goes to Diana for coming up with the name. Yeah. I think, yeah, we were brainstorming different things and this was one that really came to her head, like lightning. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it, it just sounded good, you know, it, it really went on with the mission to try and put more lights on data, you know, bring data into focus. So many times data is overlooked from a company's eyes. And even though they say, hey, we want to be data driven, they're not really putting in the effort and the resources to be data driven. And uh, yeah, I just clicked. I thought it had a nice ring to it. And it has kind of a double meaning. You are you can turn the lights on, like flip the switch, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, it clicks. Yeah, I have an idea. Or put it in the spotlight, put the lights mm -hmm. on it. So okay. you can think of it either way. And I kind of really like that uh, double meaning which yeah. is both similar and positive. Yes, yes, I really love that. And I love the name. So Diana, good job. Good job on that. Um, I see Scott here too. Hey, 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 look at that. Hello. Oh, these rainbow oh, that hearts. Must have taken a long time to choose each color for yeah. the hearts. <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy on LinkedIn, especially yeah. if you're on the desktop. So Scott, thanks for the effort there. We appreciate it. Um, we also got people from South Africa. People are still joining joining in here. Oh, we got Malaysia, India. This is uh, probably the most diverse live stream I've had in a long time. So let's talk more about lights on data. Now you turn the lights on data, right? You put mm -hmm. the spotlight on data, but mm -hmm. what do you actually do? What what sort of services, products, offerings do you do you offer? Listen, the, the full name is Lights on Data Consulting and Training. Okay. So consulting was actually the main focus initially and training kind of took the back seat. And I, I started Lights on Data right before the pandemic started. And when that hit, I really went a little bit more into the education piece. I started to become more active on LinkedIn, started creating YouTube videos and that got some really nice feedback. And I'm like, you know what? I really enjoy this process and I really want to do more of it. So the training came in 
before consulting. So consulting was more on the side to the point that I was like, you know what? I want to do less and less of the consulting work mm -hmm. and do more and more of the training piece and provide educational courses and materials and, and whatnot. And um, so mainly, I mean, right now, that's what it is. It's providing those courses, uh, templates and resources and ways that you can hopefully learn more about data manage management, data governance. Right. And it's, um, I know you have a lot of pre-recorded courses. Is mm -hmm. there anything that you do like live in person? I, I do right now. It's just at conferences, uh, okay. but there might be a couple of things coming up that I can't mm -hmm. talk about them yet that uh, there'll be some live sessions. Yeah, tell happening. us, tell us, George, come on. I'm kidding. I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So you presented conferences. Let's talk about the courses. How many courses mm -hmm. do you have and what are they? I have four courses right now. So the, um, I don't know what, what to call it, queen of the ball. It's my favorite. Okay. <laughs> it's called practical data governance implementation. Okay. So listen, in, in my journey of growing as a data governance practitioner, obviously you need to learn. You, you don't just learn on the job. So I went through a lot of books and courses that were out there and you know attending conferences and things uh, like that. Anything that I could get my hands on obviously mm -hmm. interacting with other data governance professionals and, and whatnot. And a lot of the content out there was very theoretical and very, okay, well, this is interesting or this doesn't tell me much. Yeah. And it would make me question, okay, now that I've attended this session, what can I do with that when I go next day to work? So I kind of tried to flip that and learn from it. And for me, it was, okay, I want to put together that material for you, the attendee, the course attendee, Right. the student, that you can actually take whatever you're learning in that lesson and you know how to apply next day at work. You have some actionable items. You have some templates that it's, I think it's so much cheesy when you have a sample, you have a, an example, a template, and you can just fill out and uh, you know change to your own needs. So that right. was the concept uh, behind the, the practical data governance piece that there's some a lot of practical stuff there, a lot of examples. And was that the first course that you made? No, that's the last course that I made. Ah, so I think okay. I've, I've also learned along the way. This was actually the first course I wanted to do, but I was always kind of afraid. It was like, oh, I really want this to be really good and be okay. a lot better than my own journey. Mm -hmm. So I tackled a few other topics first. All right. What was the first I just course? I learned along the way. The first course was about business glossaries. Uh-huh. And um, that was something that I've implemented in my day-to-day -day job at the University of British Columbia had you know was highly successful we won a few awards and the business glossary is that collection of business terms with their unique definitions and other useful related information kind of think of it uh, of a dictionary but without having the multiple meanings for the same word mm -hmm. okay. and the business glossary kind of covers all these different business terminologies like well what is a customer what is a warehouse what is a student and it's usually things that you think well, of course we know what a customer is but no, when you're talking about with different departments, different units, different individuals, even within the same unit, those have multiple, come up with de multiple definitions and which oh, yeah. leads to a lot of confusion, right? And I mean, you you, you worked a lot with uh, this type of data, Kate, and uh, develop dashboards and reports and it can really uh, differ what one audience can think of the same thing than another would. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially when it comes to customers, right? Even before I got into data, I was in risk management. And this is when I was focused on um, consulting for large financial services institutions. Yeah. When Dodd-Frank came out and the concept of legal entity identifiers, those LEIs, and sort of trying to understand who you have credit risk with and who do you have mm. exposure to. And these, these big companies, they could not understand who they had business with because, you know, a lot of times the customer is, you think, maybe, you know, McDonald's, but then you have McDonald's franchises, you have McDonald's, you have like all these right. subsidies and it's right. just so, and who owns who? And it just, it gets so complicated, but even in smaller companies, um, one might call them clients, one might call them customers. So even naming things is, it can be very confusing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> I'm just seeing Scott. He's, he said, Sorry, I was late. I thought Kate was on George's show, but George is on Kate's show. Yes. Does it really matter, <laughs> Scott? It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> so, all right. So that's course number two, but, but it was actually course number one. That was the yeah. first course you made. 
Exactly. What else? You got? Yeah, and, and that was kind of testing the waters as well, and I started, you know, pre-selling the course before I created it to yeah. see is there any traction on it, mm -hmm. and there was, uh, to my surprise. And uh, of course, it helped that it was 50% off or something like that. <laughs> I always offer my courses for 50% off when I'm pre-launching it. Here's a tip for the next one. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that was the, so that was the first one. Second one was on data governance maturity models. There was nobody that was doing that. So I had a, a few courses that w were gaining a lot of traction on, on Google. And mm -hmm. so I had a lot of uh, audience coming in on Lights on Data because of those, those uh, articles. Okay. on data governance maturity models so i thought you know i'm gonna create a course that's a little bit more comprehensive talks about all of these things and uh that was the second one yeah you know it's always it's always tricky when you get an idea and you're like well nobody else has done it and then you have to sort of take a pause and think is it Why? because yeah is it because nobody else wants it or is mm -hmm. it because they just simply haven't thought of it i i had a similar experience with my the book i'm working on now which is color-wise using color intentionally for data storytelling. And upon searching like Barnes and Nobles, which still exists, Amazon and other, other sites for a book on this mm -hmm. topic, I couldn't find one. And my theory was either nobody cares about it or nobody just thought to write it. And I guess we'll see when it comes out later this year. <laughs> what I think really it's happened. the second, because I remember when, when you first started talking about it and I thought that's, that's a brilliant idea. And I was surprised that there's no books that tackle that just yet. So. Yeah. And when I spoke to publishers, they even said like, oh, we want you to write a book maybe on broader data storytelling or just data visualization. And there are books out there on color theory, color psychology, but no one's sort of brought them together yet. Yeah. yeah. And just, so excited that O'Reilly decided to get on board and um, and let me let me let me try this thing out hey. with them. So, do you know when that's slated to come out? Uh, no, it, I think we've scheduled September ish, but it depends on how everything goes. Like, I still, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's an iterative process. I give them stuff, they give me feedback. I have to make mm -hmm. updates. Then it's going to go under several different reviews and editing, copy editing, and cover design, all really cool, exciting stuff um, to go on a journey with, with O'Reilly. Cool. So, all right. And the last course. And the last one? course is you, you think it's completely different and actually it is, and it's called data visualization for data storytelling. Yes. So it's covering those best practices on the data visualization piece that obviously you need in a data story. And it talks about all the different graphs that you can have, uh, when to use what, it covers a little bit of the color piece, but not as extensively as you will in your book. Yeah. But it, there's definitely a couple of uh, lessons there. And that one is um, I've um, co-taught it with my colleague, Donabel Santos, who's who's a brilliant uh, data storyteller and data uh, visualization expert and Tableau expert, though the course is, um, you know, tool agnostic. Uh-huh. Yeah, my, my courses on data visualization are also tool agnostic, but I've also used Tableau, which is interesting that... Uh, mm -hmm. Donovan also used <laughs> used Tableau for that. I think it was just pretty easy for me to pick up and and use. Um, all right, so you've got the courses. You don't do as much consulting now. You do some training and conferences. I know you also have a live show. Let's talk about the show. The lights on data show. <laughs> <laughs> when yeah. we put the lights on, guess what? Data. Still. Wow. <laughs> and that one has an even wider range of topics. It's really anything data related. Mm -hmm. So we, we, the idea is we bring in industry experts, such as yourself, Katie. You were on the show a couple of times. And uh, we talk about something that's related to their expertise that has to do with data. So anything from you know data science, data analytics, AI, machine learning, um, data strategy, that's usually a really big topic that hits home for a lot of people, data quality, data governance, data management, and, and whatnot. And even, you know, cybersecurity and, and things related to data. So it's a wider audience. I think it's really caters to anybody and everybody. The mm -hmm. idea is maybe we do have a, a very nice fan base that tunes in almost every time. But we're also cognizant that there's people that will just want to join in for that one episode that's related to their areas. And what's cool, as you know, about these live shows that both of both of us do is that we get to interact with the audience, too. So there's, you know, questions and comments and uh, makes it a little bit more lively and you mm -hmm. know, conversation wise. Uh, it's it's really fun. 
Yeah, absolutely. I love the format um, as well, because we get to see what the audience is thinking live versus, okay, mm -hmm. let's save questions and comments till the end. And mm -hmm. then what if somebody had a really good question that would have helped alleviate everyone else's yeah. questions in their mind that we could have addressed yeah. early on. Um, but allow me, allow me to also give you some kudos for the Lights on Data show, which, by the way, it was called differently. Uh, oh, what before. was it called before? It was called Good Data Morning Show. Oh my God, I remember that. <laughs> it's like good morning, but it's good data morning. Yes. Exactly. Wow, that was a exactly. long act. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I made swag and everything for it. And then I think a week <laughs> after the swag came, I'm like, you know what? It might be confusing. It might be confusing to have good data morning show and then the lights on data brand. Um, I should just get rid of the good data morning show and rebrand the lights on data show. So that's what happened. But back to the kudos part, Kate, is because of you, I got to actually do it. Here's here's what happened. Okay, so I've applied for LinkedIn Live. And back in the day, I don't know how it is now, but not everybody would get access to it, even though you applied for it. I, I still don't know what the criteria was. And I've applied for it. And I think within a week or so, I got access. I think I was actually in, in New York. And no, it was Washington, D.C. at a conference. And um, and that's actually where I filmed the uh, 10 Days of Christmas with uh, Scott Taylor. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's fun. <laughs> that, that's fun. Anyways, and I got the the email that, hey, you've got approved. I'm like, okay, cool. Wow, so so nice. I do want to do something with it, but like, oh, you know, I want to do this and that and overthinking it, I think, right? And uh, six months later, you and I are having conversations and I told you, oh, yeah, I have LinkedIn in live access i've had it for six months and you're like what you, you gotta start it started this was like people on wednesday were waiting for access they were like yeah. bugging linkedin we need yeah. access we need yeah. access so. and, and you're like george take advantage of this this is you know <laughs> such a good thing to have take advantage do something with it start it now and this was on a wednesday i think when you know had the conversations and literally that friday Dan and I went live on LinkedIn and, you know, we had a great response. Of course, the algorithm really pushed it to a lot of people too. So yeah. it just felt so good and energizing. And uh, we've done it since, I think, almost every week. Wow. I love it. And it, so it is still every week on Fridays, yes? Yeah, usually on Friday. Sometimes we kind of go off off days, uh, mm -hmm. depending on, on the guest. But usually it's on Fridays, yes, at 11 a.m. Um, yes. Eastern time. Perfect. I love it. Um, Andrew's asking if you can rename it to Lights on Data Science Infinity. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> you know, I love it's, it. It's interesting when you're sort of running your own company or you know whatever you call it, your own thing, you don't really think too much about it. So you had your good data morning show and then you had your lights on data company. Mm -hmm. I also had my story by data company and I had my dedicated academy and I had like some other stuff just happening. And I remember talking to Andreas, telling him that he had learned data engineering and team data science. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Why do you have two names? People are going to get confused. Mm -hmm. Then I'm like, wait, I'm doing the exact same thing. So as I was telling him <laughs> what to do, I basically made myself delete all things story by data because I realized how confusing it can be for, for other people. Right, right. And yeah. and yeah, you don't realize it when you're deep into it because to you it's like oh yeah, of course it's obvious it makes sense yeah, oh. it makes sense yeah yeah <laughs> and we i think you and i also like the diversity of it too and we yeah. come up with different ideas and you know different names click and it's like yeah of course i want to do something like that yeah no one's here to stop you from doing things like if i wanted to change my company name right now no one's gonna say kate no you've been building this brand don't do it mm -hmm. i'll just do it and face the consequences and see what happens and sort of learn as i go exactly uh, Exactly. That makes it fun. And, I think. and you have a trademark now too, don't you? I've trademarked it. Yes. Dedicated. Very Don't want cool. anyone stealing that one now. Although there are so many uh, people, if you Google dedicated t-shirts, at least 10 or 15 other companies are selling my dedicated t-shirts with terrible font. It's like too big. It looks so bad. I'm like <laughs> wondering if people actually buy that. Um, but listen, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to chase, chase them around. Um, so about the shows, I wanted to ask, so it's yeah. already May. Well, let's say we're a few months into the year. Uh, what was your favorite show so far? You have oh, to wow. Pick one. You have mm. to pick one. Good question. Uh, listen, there, there are a lot. And, you know, obviously the ones with you and, and Susan and Scott, they're, you know, very dear to my heart as you guys are very dear to my heart. 
Uh, so those stand out, you know, by default. I, I really enjoyed the one that I did with uh, Scott and Susan last December. We were all three of us. We were in San Diego, and we did like a raid my swag thing. And you were there too, virtually, uh, at least for the first first part. And we were kind of just going through our goodie bags and it's like, oh yeah, that's good. Ah, oh, this bad. Um, <laughs> Kind of felt bad about some of them, but I it, it got some nice traction. I actually got a couple of companies contacting me after. I was like, hey, oh, we really? want to be on our show and uh, we'll give you better swag. <laughs> oh my God, that's that's pretty good. Yes, I remember that. That was really, really funny. Um, like you and Susan were pretty nice about it. And then Scott, if you're still here, Scott was brutal. He's like, what is this? This is <laughs> terrible. I hate this. This makes no sense. The logo makes no sense. I'm like, oh my God. He's like, what company even is this? Does anybody know what company this is? <laughs> yeah, oh, there I, he is. I had that company on, on uh, the show afterwards. Oh actually. my God, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> well, did they think that, you know, are they thinking about making their logo or swag a bit more evident? No word on know. that? <laughs> no word on that. I didn't bring it up. Um, I'm not going to ask you about your least favorite show because that's just mean. So, well, you know, the least favorite show, it was because of technical difficulties. So I think okay. there was like a broadband issue and we could barely hear the other person. And, uh, that's why oh, we never got converted into a podcast either. It was a really good topic too, but, uh, on text analytics, but unfortunately it just didn't work out. Yes. That that's one of my nightmares that I'm trying to sort of like calm myself down before every show. If the internet mm -hmm. just stops working, mm -hmm. it has definitely happened. And it, you know, even to, so during some of my really good shows, they they still are one of my good shows. Like with Mike Wimmer, my internet was going absolutely crazy. I remember. Poor kid, he just had to keep going. He's. I remember tuning back in at some point, and he's like, "I would just take the questions if I just knew how to." He's like, "I don't care. <laughs> I don't need Kate here at all." So she she was really good, uh, but. It's so stressful as the host where it's like yeah. inviting people to a party and not being able to open the doors. It's like they're Absolutely. all there. But, you know, you're doing such a good job and you're not really phased out by it. And it doesn't oh, yeah. show that you're stressed. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but I definitely felt it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm just glad that there is the phone in case the Internet does go mm -hmm. out. Like the, mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi goes out, the phone still works. Um. All right. I want to stop talking about data for just a few minutes and mm -hmm. get into the topic of lattes. So every right. once in a while, I open up LinkedIn and a lot of times I'll see a photo similar to what you just did of you and some really pretty coffee. What's what's the story behind that? OK, well, let me just fast forward a little bit by saying I think one time it took me a while to post it on Saturday. So now I post it every Saturday. And it was maybe noon and I was like, ah, you know, lazy morning and was like, you know, should I? And people started messaging me. It's like, George, is everything okay? We're not seeing the latte on LinkedIn. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I guess I got to keep going with it. And the crazy thing is every time I'm trying to relate it to somewhat data. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm running out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but the way it started, here's how it started. I'm, I love lattes. And um, I didn't before, you know, not a big coffee drinker overall. And I think during the pandemic or maybe a little bit before, it was just a reason to kind of go out, sit at a coffee shop and enjoy the atmosphere and the vibe and, you know, being outdoors, getting some sunshine on you. And uh, that really helped in the pandemic, too, where you couldn't really do much, but you could go grab a latte and like walk, walk it on the street mm -hmm. and uh, enjoy and it's a nice way to kind of start the morning. And I also decided, okay, if I'm going to pick up this hobby, I'm going to be a snob about it. <laughs> so I'm not going to go to Starbucks and things like that. You know, there'll be just local coffee shops and I'm going to try different things. And if it's like scolding hot, I'm going to complain about it. <laughs> okay, not not to the, the barista, but I'm going to complain on LinkedIn or something I, like that. Yeah, I can't see you complaining to the barista. You're no, just not no. that type who's going to say, I'm going to need to send this no. back. Or... <laughs> but it did happen to me a couple of times that barista, this particular place that I usually go to, he just made like very like hot coffee. And the problem with that, it really changes the taste. It really does. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you let it cool down, it has a different taste to it. And it's not so, so good. And one time I saw him that he was working there and I got in and I got out without ordering. Like, okay, I'm going to go to another oh place God. because of it. 
<laughs> you are a snob, my goodness. I you know, it probably that. changes the taste because by that time you've burned your tongue and now your taste buds <laughs> can't taste the right way. I'm wondering <laughs> if it's that or if it really is the, the taste of the coffee that's that's throwing you off. I think it is. I think it, it changes the the milk itself too. And yeah, I think it does change it. All right. Yeah. We're going to take some questions. I got a question here from Ravit. Um, oh, for both host to host, because Ravit's got his Ravit show. He does. What are three tips you'd like to share with someone who wishes to start their journey in podcasting? Mm. I want... know. I know your first tip where you're going to say. Do you? Okay, let's I, go. I think you're going to say, well, first one is just do it. <laughs> I was going to say have fun doing it. It's close. It's close. <laughs> All okay. right. What's, okay. what's your first half one? Marks. <laughs> My first one, I think, well, we're going to get rid of the obvious ones. Like, you know, think of a name because you can actually potentially stick with it forever type of a thing. Right. Yeah. Right. Um don't but i guess don't overthink it because i was overthinking and i wasn't doing it because of that so yeah. back to your point i think that that just do it, it really worked on me i th yeah i think one thing that really helped me early on with just video production it wasn't even podcasting it was my humans of data science i'll call it an experiment slash project that's really mm -hmm. what it was it really helped um finding the right people that i actually wanted to speak with to get on the show so not not going after someone who you're extremely intimidated by or uncomfortable speaking to, um, but also not talking to just your buddies, right? So just sort of somewhere having a balance where you're really excited to talk to this person, but you're not so frightened that you're, you know, choking up on your words mm -hmm. um, and having fun with a few of these sessions in the beginning and sort of working your way up. And a lot of times, like one of some of my best shows were the ones that were with people I didn't think would ever even say yes to being on my show. Mm -hmm, so it's sort mm -hmm. of like, wow, this person's on my show. This is so cool. And it like gives you all this more, more excitement. Um, so I, I think, yeah, you mentioned picking a name. I think that's something that you can pick and change as we both have done. Yeah. <laughs> Ravid hasn't changed yeah. his name yet. <laughs> it's the Ravid show forever. So I don't think he's going to change that. Um, yes. Just starting is, is a great tip and yeah. it's, it yeah, go ahead. And, and a couple others that I can think of. I think uh, sound is definitely very important. So invest in, in a microphone other than just your laptop or your uh, device's microphone. Yes. <laughs> I think it's more important than, than it seems. Uh, yeah. So invest into it. It doesn't have to be a lot of money, but it's definitely worth it. And the second one, I think it, I, I, I remember initially I was getting like, oh, you know, will that person want to be on my show? Should I ask him? Should I not? You know, I'm not um, I'm not there yet. I don't have the brand established, but I think overall people like to be on on other people's podcasts and shows. So don't be afraid to ask. Just ask. And what's the worst that could happen? And really, the worst that could happen is they would say, you know, not just yet. I'm very busy right now, but contact me again in a few months. Has, have you gotten many not just yet or no's for your show? I've gotten a well. A, 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 f a couple, maybe a few, a handful on uh, not just yet, but mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever received a no. Yeah, I think for the most part, I've gotten in general yeses. Um, and a, a lot of times people are coming to to me saying, hey, how do we get to be on the show? Right. Mm -hmm. And then that happened over time, obviously. But there have been times when I would ask someone to speak, maybe part of the conference or get on the show that their main reason for saying no would be due to their company that they work for having restrictions going through their, you know, special protocols to get approval to speak. Um, so that's been the, the main reason. Um, but other than that, you're right. People are just excited mm -hmm. to do this. They're like, yeah, yeah, I get to talk about myself. This is great. See, you're on my show right now. Why? Because you get to talk about yourself. It's all about George today. <laughs> Putting the lights on, George. George and Data. Oh, that's another name. <laughs> George on Data. There is a Dave on Data, right? So there's a yeah, uh, David Langer. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And by the way, speaking of which, I was surprised when I first found out that some people need to get permission from their companies and get like written agreements and uh, sometimes even my signature 
on on those agreements like mm-hmm. what somebody actually even told me that they got to go through a special training first yep. with their company to get approved and get certified that they can then speak on behalf of the company and yep. know what to say what not to say so yeah i yeah i remember that I was actually in Toronto at a conference and I was walking around sort of doing these little videos uh, for all the sponsors of that conference, just going up to the booth, kind of like you guys did with the swag. But instead of Mm -hmm. rating the swag, I I just gave them each like 90 seconds of fame. I'm like, okay, here, you tell tell me about yourself. And I just like stand there with my my phone um, in front of me or something Mm -hmm. recording. And there was one company, like a really, really big company. I won't say their name, but um, they were excited to do it. And then the person I spoke with, she came back and she's like, oh, actually, you know, the person who is cleared to be on camera, like is gone for the day. <laughs> okay. There's like, so they had people who were actually cleared to do this type of thing and they had to undergo a special training. Um, and they said they have just a lot of protocols to go through to put out any type of content, which could be good because you sort of have more control, right? Mm-hmm, over mm-hmm. what comes out there. But I see it as a bit limiting because I'm more of the free flowing, like, let's just put everything out there. It's, you know, just have fun with it. Yeah. Uh, that would be hard to do in a big company. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it makes sense. I get that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's also fun not to work for such a company and have more flex- flexibility. <laughs> yes, that's the best. <laughs> so I did want to talk about data quality. You told me you have some cool stories. So let's let's think of your favorite story on mm. the impact of poor data quality. I'll give you the spotlight here so you could share whichever story you'd like. And and there's so many. And uh, yeah, maybe we have time for a couple. But the first one that really stuck with me was, I think, maybe my first conference that I've attended, which is focused on data quality alone. And there was this this guy that worked for, oh, I forgot who he worked for, but I know he had a contract with NASA. And he gave us this example from, uh, I think it was 1999, and NASA lost this $125 million Mars orbiter because of bad data or bad data quality. So here's what happened. There were two engineering teams, one from Lockheed Martin, the other one from NASA. And they've utilized different measurement units in a really key spacecraft calculations. So Lockheed used the English units of measurement and NASA used the metric system. Obviously, you would think. And, you know, of course, that data transformation piece didn't output with the right numbers. And, you know, I guess the data would have been bad if it had been consistent, but it wasn't. It was clear they didn't have data governance to make them both aware that, hey, this is the measurement system that you both should be using. So there are assumptions made on both sides. Uh, you know, again, the calculations were right, but the conversion was not happening between the uh, measurement units. Okay. So, um, yeah, you know, imagine like all those years invested by so many people into this Mars orbiter, wow. and it was just lost because of this one key uh, mishap that they forgot to kind of share this metadata between them. A hundred and twenty-five million dollar orbiter. That's that's a big mistake for bad data. And yes, that's that's a that's a great example. And thank you for sharing that. And I think that number is probably small in comparison to the combined number of losses across the world due to poor data quality. Or I I know, I know, I know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's something but, we but, can't even quantify. Probably. I know. Well, there was this, uh, this report years ago, and they were saying that in the U.S. alone, it probably costs like $3 trillion each year. Um, yeah, bad just, data quality. Wow. That's, that's, that's something that we're tracking. Like, imagine all the stuff that, like, just decisions made on poor, poor data, and you didn't even know that it was, yeah, not yeah. only money, but I'm thinking in, in healthcare, right? Poor data yeah. quality can lead to oh, yeah. death, actual death. Like, you just misinterpret something or there's a glitch or somebody mistyped a number, um, gave yeah. the wrong medicine to address that number. And then, oh, look what we've done. Oops, yeah. data. There, there yeah. was a, something in the news a few years ago. Uh, I think it was in England. And um, wh- why this story got in the news is because they've discovered they, were, they had 17,000 men as part of their healthcare system registered as being pregnant. 
which of I won't course would happen. Honestly, in this day and age, I will not be surprised. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know that, that that led to some odd calls and uh, prescriptions, and uh, but also billing. And from uh, you know a regulatory perspective, there were some issues there. And yeah. So how do you think we're doing as? Um, I guess, let's say as an, as a nation, we could focus on Canada, U S maybe talk about those two together in addressing this problem. Do you think we're doing a good job? I think it's getting better, but we're not there yet. I mean, we, we mostly as companies, I think we like to focus on the, the shiny things mm -hmm. and the cool things like the data science and AI and machine learning of, of stuff and without really paying attention to the underlying data. That's usually something that gets handled by like on the side of your desk and it's not, um, yeah, just professionally managed, I guess. It, they're, they're not investing resources into that. They're kind of just dealing with the after, after fact. You know, like a perfect example is when, when you're talking to managers and they're very happy about their data and it's because they don't know they have these teams behind that report every time it's being pulled and outputted and printed and however it gets consumed, they're actually manually going in there and making sure there's some data transformation happening. There's mm -hmm. a, some data cleaning happening. So the reports are in order, but there's a lot of human power that goes into it and that it shouldn't. It yeah. should be tackled at the source. So do you, do you think things like data reliability, data observability, data mesh, are those going to help address the issue? I think it's definitely going to surface the issue initially. So that that's the first step that was going to make more people aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually, you know, what usually happens when you're building a new ERP, CRM, you're implementing all of that stuff, and it gives you the opportunity to surface a lot more of that data and have more people interact with it and have right. more eyes on it. So same with the data mesh and data observability and a data catalog, I think it brings all of that to multiple employees and not just a handful that he had before. So now you have more opportunities, more voices to raise issues, but then right. something needs to be done with that. So I don't think it, it will fix it, but I think it really helps to bring up the, the problems that uh, there might be. Yes, yes. There's an, a company I spoke to recently that were, you know, they were talking about the alerts of, let's say, poor data quality or something's gone wrong that's going to impact these, you know, 10 dashboards mm -hmm. downstream and all that. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's really helpful, but we still need the people. We It's helpful to know something bad is happening. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, oh, we're going to have a flood. Okay, great. Do we just stand there and wait for the flood? No, we. everyone has to sort of get together and, and address the issues and, and, you know, maybe put sandbags or whatever the equivalent of addressing data quality issue would be here. Um, so it's still, it still does take a lot of manpower. And I'm personally thinking that the, you know, the further we go into the future, the less manpower we'll need because I think machines are getting smarter, they're getting better. Um, and humans are going to still need to be there, but maybe in a, in a lesser extent. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, I mean, humans are still needed, at least in the onset to program the AI and to provide those business rules and standards. Yeah. And then, uh, everything else can be automated as much as possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right, let's see, just checking in. Ben says, hi. Hey, hey Ben. We're talking about data, if you've got questions. It's pretty broad. So Christine is asking, um, do you think the extra time and money it takes to invest in resources to ensure data quality is the biggest contributor to poor data quality? The extra time and money it takes to invest in resources. Yes. So the the money that you're investing, it's one that actually creates the poor data quality? No, do you think that the fact that we need like all this time from oh, people right. and all this money... Right is is the reason that we have poor data quality no I, I don't think that's why i think we have poor data quality because things are unclear from the get-go so i don't think we're i think we we kind of learn a lot by doing within a, an a organization we kind of ask okay well we need to capture this data mm -hmm. and but then we're not really thinking of the repercussions if we're not putting too many um you know gates or eyes on it so mm -hmm. I think we're implementing a new form to capture this data, but we're not thinking of, okay, how to best capture it, 
how to you know have drop downs instead of free form free text yeah if that's possible and we're just not thinking of what what could happen let's just kind of figure it later it i think i kind of see it as you know how you're cleaning and you have a rug and you can like sweep the mess under the rug type of thing and somebody will discover that later it works it you know it helps your issue for now um, but you're keep piling up the, this mess yes and i've been there you know when you were describing the form with the drop down and the free oh my god i've been there in both you know working at a company and within my own forms that i've designed myself i'm like why didn't i didn't I use a drop down? Why mm-hmm. was I, you know, because I guess you don't predict, you don't think far in the future where I thought I'd get 10 responses, but instead I got 10,000, right? So it's like, yeah. uh, now I have to clean up 10,000 items where if I were just a little bit smarter and even made it easier for the person filling out the form, it just would have saved everybody time. So I think just sitting down and thinking, thinking ahead in terms of how you know user accessibility and making it easier for yeah. individuals as well as easier for you later on is important. But in my experience, people are also, um, what's another word for lazy? I'm going to go with the other word for lazy, whatever that might be. Because I remember uh, we, were, we were doing a data quality project um, and it was all about the CRM system. We had to make sure that a team of thousands of individuals are putting in data Mm -hmm. accurate data in Mm -hmm. all of the fields that were required and you know what happens when there are required fields but you don't have an answer to that question and you know you'll have to ask someone else for that answer but you need to complete the form today what are you going to do you're not going to waste time that you know who knows when this person will answer you type in na blah blah Mm -hmm. blah Mm -hmm. asdf or blah you know whatever (laughs) your fingers can type in and you sort of move on with your life so i think um maybe better training for those individuals and letting them know the impact of that poor data quality that it can have on the actual business and maybe having some sort of accountability where it says, Hey, George, I saw you typed in the word Apple where you were supposed to pick a country. Like (laughs) that was bad, right? Like calling people out and saying, we saw that you made this mistake and sort of having that ability to, to track changes might Mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I, I I agree. We still have a long way to go. But hey, maybe Apple will be a country at one point. <laughs> oh my God, that's a good point. <laughs> at least an island somewhere, right? I would right. not be surprised. Be an, I'm going to Google today. I'll go to Apple. An tomorrow. Apple-shaped <laughs> island. Yep, and then there'll be a meta island. I can see this happening. Mm-hmm, watch mm-hmm. ten years from now, we'll watch this video and laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Can we buy stocks now into the island? I know, yeah. right? Well, it probably will be a whole country at that point. Um, yes. So let's see. Robert's asking if you've got lumpy rugs. Do you do that at home when you're cleaning? Do you sweep things under the rug? <laughs> you know what? So I use my, uh, I have a cat and yes. uh, the cat has a brush that I use it sometimes, especially in the summer. It's, you know, shedding. You have a cat too, Kate, don't you? I have a cat, yes. Or you still do? I still do, yes. She's not here, but yeah. And I use the brush. I use the cat's brush on the rug to, to kind of scrape it from stuff that's... Um, yeah, kind of sticking to it. Yes. <laughs> Where's your cat? Do we get to meet the cat now or no? Do you want to see the cat? Yeah, let's see the cat. Okay. Hold on, One let second. me put you in full screen. All right, everybody, this is exciting. We're about to see the cat. Here we go. Oh, nice. Look at that. Very nice. Thank you. What's your cat's name? Cute, right? Yes, adorable. What's What's your cat's name? Rasta. Rasta. And he came with the, the the name came with the cat, so we didn't choose it for for him. Okay, where'd you get the cat? It was a rescue cat um, that nobody would get at the shelter for some reason, and it was just the most adorable thing. And we got it. Well, one of the reasons why they wouldn't get it because it has uh, like a medical problem, so he had mm-hmm. to get some pills every day. But after six months, we took it to the vet, and they're like, "No, you can take him off of it, so he's healthy." Oh, nice. Wow. I guess it was yeah. meant to be. You were willing to put up with the medical issue and you got blessed with the fact that you no longer have to. That's great. Yeah. It's a fun cat. Data cat Aiden. Data Kaden. Data <laughs> That can Scott's work. always there with the witty, witty remarks. Um, all right. So, George, we know what you do on your Saturdays. You 
sleep. I have my lattes. You have your lattes and you probably play, you know, with the cat, hang out with your wife and stuff. But Kate, I can't sleep in because if I don't post my latte post, oh. you know, people will like hound me. <laughs> yes, no sleeping in. Yes, people are worried. It's good. Like you're you're a superstar. People are like, where's the where's the weekly photo? It's like um, Susan with her lip singing. Susan, oh my god, if she's I'm not I'm not there yet. I'm not at Susan level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good luck. Good luck. It's gonna take some time. She's been at this for a while, you know. Yes. Um, so what does your other days look like? You're like Monday through Friday, typical day. I mean, it's lots of work, to be honest. Uh okay. work during the day for UBC and then evening I try and spend on lights on data and LinkedIn. But for fun, I mean, I like to play basketball, like I mentioned, and uh, all these outdoor activities, bike, walk around, hike. Uh, I haven't done that in a while. And um, I love water. I really love water. I, I like to be on water, not so much under the water. So I'm not a fan <laughs> of scuba diving. I've never tried it and I don't have a desire to okay. for some reason. But I like things that are water related that keeps my head above the water. Mm -hmm. Things all like right. surfing. I was going to say surfing sounds like one of those activities. So tell us, uh, I heard you're really good at surfing. What are some tips? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm horrible at surfing. I think I can maybe balance myself on the board for five seconds would be long. So it would be a bit less than that. But I just love the experience. So you know what I love first? Getting in the water, if the waves are huge, but not dangerously huge, uh, just facing them because you got to go out, right? You got to go into the ocean past the break point of the waves. So then you can wait for the wave and like paddle around uh, once it comes. And that journey to the break point is harsh, man. I mean, you have all those waves in nature coming, you know, against you. You're like, come at me. I'm going to get you. I'm going to pass by you. So it's like a struggle to get out there. But the struggle, it's so endearing and it's so motivating. I just love that, you know, part of it too. Wow. And once you're there, you kind of calming yourself down. You're waiting for that perfect wave. And when it comes, even if I'm unable to stand and if I just lay flat on the board, when you're catching it, your board stiffens mm -hmm. and it becomes like solid as a rock and more stable. And you feel the power of that wave behind you. And it's, it, it's such a nice feeling. I've never tried it. You're making me want to try it. This is... It's something I've always wanted to try, but I guess in New York, the beaches are not that great. I mean, I, I don't really go to the to the beaches here. I only go to the beach if I'm traveling to like Florida or Caribbean or something. Nice. You, you do this in Canada? I do it in Canada, yeah. Um, off the coast here, there's an island called Vancouver Island, okay, and which is as big as Holland, I'm told. Okay. So it's, it looks small on... on um, the map but it's actually big and off off the west coast of vancouver island there's basically nothing else but ocean whereas here in vancouver we have a little a lot of islands and it's very calm or more calm than there so because of that you have all these big waves and everything and it's just beautiful region and it's very like hippie like and calm and you have the mix of uh, you know cypress trees and like christmas trees and then the beach which is like what how do they go together but you do yeah. need to wear a wetsuit because the water is a bit cold so ah okay and how did you get into this is, is this something that diana does with you she does yeah she loves the water as well nice. she's equally bad <laughs> that's good because if she was like really good mm -hmm. or like really terrible it would be like mm -hmm. come on you know mm -hmm. that would be better than me so you're both trying to like Stay on the same level as long we're, as you can. Yes, we're, we're trying to get more stable. Though we haven't been there in uh, more than a year now because of the pandemic. It was hard to travel. So okay. I'm hoping to pick it up again. Well, yeah, warm weather is coming, right? I'm sure you'll have plenty yeah. of opportunities yeah. this year. Yeah. All right, George, we'll take one last question from the audience and then we will wrap this up. So back to data quality. We went from all that back to data quality. So Hillary's asking, would you say that data quality should be more stressed on than something like data analysis and data science? Maybe not more, but at least as much. So I think in any data analytics and data science projects, you're actually doing this. When you're doing data wrangling, so to speak, a lot of times you're cleaning data. Yeah. So instead of doing that every time and having as part of, what was it, like 60% of data 80%. scientists? 80%. There 80%. you go, even more. 
wow, so maybe things are going worse, not better. <laughs> um, right? It's it's been on cleaning the data. Why not just have a, a program that tackles it at its source when possible? And if not, you have something that before it goes to the data scientist, it's at least cleaner than it should be. Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's sort of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Here we've got data quality, poor data quality leads to poor data analysis. And you sort of have to take care of that one mm -hmm. first. And I, I agree, if you can clean it at the source, definitely do that. I think it becomes complicated as you get more and more data, data sources. You have third-party data sources connecting with other data sources, and it just gets so confusing. So I applaud these, these companies and consultants and people who are and your courses who are, who are taking the time to really address this major problem because without data quality, you, you don't have data analysis. You, you can't really get insights from data that is not valuable or it's not, it's not clean. It's not accurate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. On that note, guys, data quality is important. Go ahead and follow George Ferrican. Check out lightsondata.com. Make sure you tune into the Friday shows and check out the Saturday lattes and uh, we, hopefully we'll see some surfing, uh, surfing videos of you and Diana on, you know, on the waves. That would be cool to see this summer. But George, thank you so much for being on the dedicated show. Thank so, you so much, Kate. It's a, it's pleasure, a pleasure as always. So, all right. Thank everybody. you, everyone. Thank you. Stay dedicated, just like George's shirt. I will see everybody online. There you go. Bye, Bye everyone.